Good morning, Mark Morial here, president of the National Urban League, and we will soon be in a great conversation with Andaba Mandela, uh, the 36-year-old grandson of Nelson Mandela and a humanitarian activist and global leader in his own right. Uh, he's been an ambassador for UNAIDS, co-founder and chairman of the Africa Rising Foundation, and uh, I am looking forward to this uh, cross-Atlantic conversation uh, with uh, Andaba Mandela uh, as we explore uh, COVID uh, and how it's affected the community of South Africa and the communities here in the United States of America. Uh, it's uh, great to be able to be on and uh, I've always uh, had a great affinity uh, for uh, the struggles of the people of South Africa. Uh, working in the 1970s and the 1980s as a student and, and later as a law student and later as a young lawyer. On many incredible great people. Uh, Nelson Mandela, there he is right there, is uh, uh, one of my great heroes in Indaba. Uh, so impressed when I met him recently, uh, yeah. all of the work he's doing. Good morning, brother. How are you, sir? I'm great. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. What time is it where you are? Oh, right now it's just after 4 p.m. Ah, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're just after 10 a.m. here uh, in, in the United States. So thank you for doing this. We appreciate you it's and all of your work, and uh, we've got lots of people joining this conversation this morning, and uh, we are so honored, honored to have this conversation. I'd like to just have you talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, we want people all over the globe, many know you, but for those that don't know of you and your work uh, and your personal conviction, maybe you could start by talking a little bit about that. Yes, so, you know, I was very lucky uh, to have been brought up by my grandfather uh, from the age of about 11 years old. Um, so, you know, I remember just one day after school playing marbles, uh, my parents were not home yet, and uh, this black BMW rolled up, you know, in the hood, like this luxury vehicle, and rolled stop. It's like, oh, what's happening here? And out jumped a man wearing a suit, and he came directly to me, and he said, I am Dava. And I said, yes. He says, my grandfather, your grandfather sent me to fetch you. Um, let's go. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I don't know you. Sorry, I'm not going with you. He's like, do you have any idea who your grandfather is? Do you want me to get in trouble? Do you want me to lose my job? And I'm like, in the back of my mind, stranger, danger, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And eventually the man gave up and he left. And I told my father what had transpired when he came home. And he said, well, if the man comes again, you should go with him. And, uh, you know, he came back a few days later and I went with him and also went to a leafy white, you know, suburb in northern Johannesburg and the gate was an electronic gate. I've never seen an electric gate. So you go inside, it's a big house, there's security, there's people working in the kitchen. It's just, you know, a whole lot of staff. And uh, that was the time when I met my grandfather and he told me, said, listen, I am taking you in, you're going to stay with me and I'm sending your parents to university. Because they never had a chance to go to university. And I want them to focus on their studies and not worry about you, so you will stay with me. Mm. And so the very next week, I moved with my grandfather. And, you know, life changed for me completely. Because before then, I actually, I was born in Soweto, but very much moved to the Eastern Cape. My first memories were in the rural village, mm -hmm. uh, where I was in a rural setting. You know, we had a chicken coop. We had, you know, there were oranges, there were plum trees, and... You know, that kind of thing. And then we moved to Soweto, where I started to notice now that we were in a ghetto, and this was black people, and, you know, you could see every time there were cops in the streets that the situation was tense. Um, and you just hear, you know, the noise. You'd see the smoke in the air. I mean, it was just one of those times. So when I moved to, you know, to the suburbs, it was definitely moving to, like, another planet for me, you know, completely. Um, and so those were, was when I, I, I had started, you know, getting some of the values of my grandfather. But before that, to be honest with you, I was really very much against white people. And I was very much 
on the reverse side of racism because I always understood that white people are the ones who initiate racism and we react, you know, and then retaliate with that same racism. Mm -hmm. So I had actually grew up wanting to be a soldier because I wanted to hit back at the enemy. You know, I saw the, the harassment, the raids, um, and just how tense things were. And I just wanted to find a way where I could contribute to helping my people. So from a young age, I was conscientized, and I knew about what was happening in society. Even though our parents never engaged with us on that, on that kind of level, we were seeing what was happening around us, and we became somewhat militant, you know, from the age of six, seven years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was uh, uh, a necessary and logical reaction to a system of deep, long-standing oppression. Yes. Uh, a system of institutional repression uh, that, uh, you know, your grandfather became an international symbol to battle against uh, for mm -hmm. his entire life. And, you know, it's so powerful that you stand on that legacy uh, with the work you're doing now. And so share with us the work you're doing now. You have the foundation. You've been involved with UNAIDS. You're yes. on multiple fronts. Uh, uh, carrying on this legacy of human rights uh, and racial yes. justice. I mean, as you know uh, yourself, uh, my brother, being a former mayor, uh, being being involved in the struggle of activism for sure, uh, probably three, four decades yourself. You know, you know that you know the, the struggle is never really you know fought on one single front. You know what I mean? Yes, right. Yes. Fronts, right, and so. You know, the first thing was, of course, seeing the the, 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 the oppression, you know, the physical oppression uh, that happens in the streets. And so, you know, now, physically, you cannot go to the school. You cannot study this profession. You know, you cannot. You are, you are restricted physically by the system that tells you you can never be an actuarial scientist. No, you can be a bus driver. You understand what I'm saying? So that's where you're, you first met with the system. And then from there, it's like you continue and eventually, okay, we get freedom. Things are supposed to be normal, right? But things are never really normal, right? Because they say education is the key, but then you can't afford education, right? You want to go to the best schools. The best schools are way out of your league. You can't pay for that. Even if you take a loan, it will still take you half your life to pay off that loan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there are multiple levels of the system where they hit you, you know, and so it, it's not possible for, for you to fight on one system. So, you know, early on, I realized that education would be a very important part of us really empowering our people. And then I realized, of course, when I lost my parents to HIV and AIDS, mm. that HIV AIDS is another inhibitor, right? It's as if the system created it again, because now the very same way you create life is the very same way you end life. You, and you you infect someone with a disease that ultimately where they die, you know? So you realize again that people who are in poverty positions don't have the right information, don't have the right access to get treatment or even to have the access to good, healthy, clean food. You know what I mean? And you, you, you ask yourself, why is it so expensive to eat healthy and so cheap to eat junk? Yes. You know? <laughs> it should be the other way around. It should be the it reverse. Should be, it should be the reverse. And you and you realize there are different, uh, not different, one system and different levels of where our people are marginalized and are really hit, you know what I mean, where they can't even move. So there is no way we can just rely on one system. And for me, it, it is so... I tell you, you know what's revealing to hear you speak is... Mm, the absolute similarities between the experiences you're describing uh, in South Africa and the experiences in the United States. Uh, hmm. as, as I grew up and started school uh, in kindergarten and first grade, it was the first year that the schools were integrated in New Orleans. Oh. So my sister and I actually traveled from our neighborhood an all-black neighborhood called Punch Train Park, we had to cross through a ditch, like a little dry creek, and go wow. into 
the white neighborhood where the school was four or five, three, three blocks into the white neighborhood. Right. Uh, and that experience of witnessing on a daily basis the separation. You grew up in your neighborhood that was all black. And then you go into this all white neighborhood. It was separated as, as, as a system of apartheid. American apartheid is what, seg is what segregation uh, really was. And I think that's why there was such a, there's always been such a bond uh, between the struggles of the people of South Africa, certainly the entire continent, and the, yeah. str the struggles of people uh, here in the United States. And it's a, it's a fascinating, uh, I think, uh, analysis. Here in the United States, even today, uh, very well-educated, uh, African American who might graduate, let's say, from a top school, right. twenty years after graduation, will not have the same income or wealth as their average white classmate. Which shows you that while education is a ticket and a key, even if you can achieve it, right, uh, it doesn't automatically function as an equalizer across the board. And, uh, and so the struggle, you know, the struggle against institutional exclusion uh, continues and, and, and it is familiar and it is it is so powerful that you've dedicated your work uh, and your life to it. And so the Africa Rising Foundation uh, yes. is so dedicated to economic development. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about the foundation and talk about how the foundation is sought to respond to COVID and the, uh, the, the COVID situation uh, in South Africa? Yes, yeah, so, you know, our, our, our foundation, Africa Rising, was really primarily set up to be an engine to empower young people, uh, mm -hmm. not only in South Africa, but on the continent. But particularly, we wanted to focus on rural areas because rural areas are really the areas that are in need more than the urban areas. Mm -hmm. Even that said, like you said, you know, even if our people in the urban areas have access to education, have access to some facilities, they get to the job place and they're still discriminated against. So for us, it was more of a way to try and, you know, get our, our young people wrapped up around the, the whole point of entrepreneurship, to mm -hmm. push entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. to say, let's not always think about finding a job. What business... What service or product can I equip or can I apply for? Can I get the funding, etc.? So we were really just teaching a young people skills. But now, when we're faced with COVID, it's a very different situation because many of our people, right, they say you have to practice social distancing. Our people live in shacks that are built on top right, of each other. Right, there is no right. social distancing opportunity. There, not even, right? not even, not even reasonable to just think that. Right. Nothing. You can't even. There's communal toilets, there's communal taps that they must use, right? So where's the social distancing there? Number two, you know, everybody needs to have a mask. Everybody needs to have sanitizers because, you know, it's really about hygiene, not about how many times you wash your hands in one hour, but really making sure that your space is very hygienic, right? And you keep yourself hygienic. Now, if you ask yourself a poor person who doesn't even have one dollar to spend, He's not going to be thinking about a mask and sanitizers. He's thinking about what's he going to eat for the day. How right? to survive. How to make How it. to survive. So what we've done, we've actually called on our corporate partners that we've worked with before. Mm -hmm. And we are actually working together with the Department of Social Development, which is the government of South Africa. And mm -hmm. next week, we're going to be, uh, we've gathered about 800 food parcels. And in each food parcel, we're going to be putting in a mask, a mask that people can actually reuse so they can wash it, they can reuse it, as well as small bottles of sanitizer. And that mm -hmm. we're going to be distributing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in Soweto, in the ghetto of Soweto, which I, which I know you're familiar with. That is, so uh, these are the kind of initiatives that we are doing right now is really to distribute food sanitizers and masks because those are the basic things that our people need which they don't have access to so here in the here in the united states the national urban league we have a network of 90 local affiliates who are community-based organizations they've got physical locations professional staff volunteers nice. and we are 
uh, align with exactly what you're doing. In many of them, they're distributing food, uh, food to people because food insecurity has become a, a great challenge. Uh, yeah. The Congress of the United States passed an unemployment benefits program, which provides some temporary dollars to people who are unemployed. We're assisting people in applying uh, for those dollars. Uh, there's a small business lending program, which is not uh, not gone as as it should have gone. Uh, mm. That provides loans that are forgivable to small business owners. We're at we're assisting black small business owners in applying for the money. Uh, but we're also advocating that the Congress uh, fix the program by creating more rules on who can get the money to make sure that smaller uh -huh. businesses have that opportunity. So uh, we sound so similar as we advocate because here in the United States, we've now got uh, 36 million unemployed people. These are people wow. who on January 1st had a job and today they're out of work because the social distancing policy adopted by the states, adopted by many local governments, has basically forced people into the unemployment lines. Now, necessary, uh, but where they could. Now, some people have continued to work because they've had to continue to work. If you work in a hospital, if you work in law enforcement, if you pick up garbage, if you're a firefighter, if you're an emergency medical technician, if you right. work at a grocery store or a pharmacy or you drive and deliver things, and in all likelihood, you've kept your job. You've been able to yes. retain your job. But we have an the so -called essential services. Essential <laughs> services. But we've got more yes. people out of work today at one time than we've had in this country since the Great Depression uh, of the wow. late 1920s and the, and the early 1930s. So it's going to take a tremendous effort. And black people, of course, now have an unemployment rate of some 16%. And of course, mm. that number is not the real number. It's certainly higher uh, yeah. because of the way the stats are kept. And so we've got a lot of you know, work ahead of us. What I'd really like you to talk a little bit about is how, how, how significant or how severe has, been the, has the effect of COVID been on South Africa? Is it lots of cases, lots of deaths? Has it been uh, modest? What's uh, help people understand the global nature of COVID-19? Well, to be honest with you, when you look at South Africa, South Africa is the country on the continent that has the most amount of coronavirus. Wow. Right? We have the most amount of cases. We also have the most amount of deaths. Right? Wow. Um, now, because we are such a developed nation compared to the rest of the continent, the loss of jobs has been very similar. Oops. Very similar, if not worse, than America. Because we have what they call here an informal uh, economy where you have the vendors, the street vendors. Yes. The potatoes, filling the fruit and vegetable, selling, um, you know, whatever they can get, cigarettes, chips, sweets, whatever it is they get. That has been completely eradicated. Mm. Right? Another thing that they did here in South Africa is that they removed the sale of cigarettes and alcohol. Wow. Now, they so you did can't, that. You can't sell cigarettes and alcohol now. You can't sell or buy cigarettes. If you sell, if you get caught selling or buying cigarettes, you could face up to six months in jail or you have to pay a hefty fine. Mm. Wow. Now, it is one of, for me, this is one of the craziest rules that they come up with. The only way they were able to substantiate this was because alcohol, you know, depresses your immune system and cigarettes, you know, messes up with your lungs and that's what the coronavirus, you know, really attacks. But there has been no empirical evidence that actually shows that continued use of alcohol actually increases the risk of coronavirus. We also, out of all these many countries that have had mad restrictions, South Africa seems to be the only one that has actually banned cigarettes and alcohol. Now, think about all those street vendors who sell cigarettes. They're out of a job. 
out of a job permanently, probably. A permanently out of yeah. a job. They don't even have a chance now, a, a single chance. You know, you could see the way this economy is fading because before you have beggars, right? Just to give you a, 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 you have beggars that are on the streets, right? On the robots. We call traffic lights robots. They're at every traffic light. The people who are begging on the streets are no longer only at traffic lights. They are in the suburbs, waiting at the stop sign, waiting on the traffic circle in the suburbs. There are people begging for food. The amount of beggars on the road has almost tripled. Mm -hmm. That's to give an idea wow. of how severe this economy has become. Yeah, how severe it's become. And you know, I... I I foresee a very bad situation mm -hmm. where the very same people now who have tripled on the streets begging for food, not knowing what to do, having no alternative, are going to reach a point of frustration that they decide to take that food or to take what it is that they deem fit. What's the government's response? Is there a system, a social safety net in South Africa that can provide some temporary support for people who find themselves in that situation? What's the, what's well, the response? We have the Department of Social Development where they have told people that they need to go and register in order for them to be able to receive food parcels. Of course, there is a huge shortage of food parcels compared to the people who are in need of food parcels. But then that's also... You know, there are two groups. There's those who are completely destitute. You're talking yes. about people that have been on the streets, sleeping on the bridges, completely poor, you know, destitute. And then there are those who have lost income, mm -hmm. but they still have a home, but they just don't mm -hmm. have an income to support that home. So those are two different groups. Yes. And now the, the situation is that there just isn't enough being provided mm -hmm. for people who are number one, destitute, and number two, those who have lost an income are not actually being met because there is also, you can't, you can't, there's also a bit of corruption. They have, mm -hmm. they have, there have been counselors found, for example, company X comes to donate a thousand parcels to the counselor. The counselor may be only donates 500 of those parcels, and the other 500 he distributes to his friends and family. Huh. People who are not even in need. There's been a number of those cases across the so people. Across people, the have, people have gained the system, so there what the government will do, it will distribute the food through its own employees or through NGOs. Or what's the system for the distribution? They, they, they have become politicized because now... Councillor X wants to use this, these parcels to try and campaign on his name because we have elections coming up next year. Ah, they yeah. even had to come up with regulations to say you're not allowed to put your face on the packaging of these parcels. You're not allowed to put your name on the packaging of these parcels that you give out to the communities. So you have people trying to game the, game the system, take advantage of the situation. But I would suspect that there are many who do not, but there are too many who do. There are too many who do, unfortunately. Um, but the, the, the Department of Social Development, I believe they're doing as much as they can in their hands to be able to communicate to communities, but to also uh, somewhat regulate the process in which companies can come, donate these food parcels, and then get those food parcels uh, delivered to the end user, right? To the actual, to the actual people who are in need of these food parcels. The problem is that what happens is that there's been a few instances where, you know, the the food truck comes into the neighborhood. People are so hungry that that truck gets attacked. My goodness! And you end up having a a a a, a blind, almost criminal way of people just savagely grabbing what they can, you know, to, to survive. Does the government have the wherewithal in this crisis to create a better way for the people, a better way to provide 
uh, a safety net or subsistence for the people? Is it the will? Is it the need for money? Is it a need for infrastructure? I mean, if you uh, if you envision a, how this ought to work, approach. we have just borrowed about three point five trillion rand. Wow! To for this particular reason. Now we have and just to put a context. A rand is what compared to a dollar. So you talk about one dollar equals eighteen rand. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not really that much, right? Well, it's but, uh, yeah, three trillion still, you know, represents uh, several uh, hundred billion. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right, about three hundred billion. Mm -hmm. Now you have the Department of Social Development, who are lacking an infrastructure because people, the lines have become too long. You have people waiting in the line for up to 16 hours to get $50 worth of food, mm -hmm. right? So they are trying to come up with infrastructure and come up with ways together with the, with the retailers, right, who provide food with digital mechanisms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that people don't have to wait in 16-hour queues to get their food. So right now... As much as the economy is depressed and is shrunk, they have other opportunities that have sprung up in terms of how do we feed 100,000 people and finding a way for them not to actually go into a single line. So again, the people who have the greatest opportunity are those with the digital minds, with digital, digital solutions who yeah. can work with governments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in dealing with the large number of people who are in need to get their food parcels. Have you all gotten past, is, is the social distancing rules eased in South Africa so that people can begin they haven't to be back? Eased. What they've done, they've introduced levels. So they've introduced level one to level five. So level one is a level whereby everything operates normally. And level five will be the highest uh, sort of lockdown. Right now we are mm -hmm. currently on lockdown uh, level four. Mm -hmm. which means some uh, companies, some industries have been allowed to open up. For example, restaurants are allowed to operate, but only to give to do takeaways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and now you can travel during the day. We have a curfew. Our curfew is 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Everyone off the street. Well, level, yeah, off the street. But level five, you're not allowed to be on the street at all. The only reason you go out is for medical attention or for food. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and and in, in that instance, uh, what's the prospect of when you get to level one? Have, has the government given any forecast? Um, they have not given any forecast, but we believe that we're going to be going to level three in the in the month of June next month. And is the is are the levels being done on a national basis or being done by what do you have provinces or regions or states? Oh no, they do, they're being done on a national level. Yeah, here in the States, uh, we have uh, the decision to reopen has been in the hands of governors, to some extent, governors of states, and to some extent in the hands of mayors and county executives. And here in the state of New York, uh, the governor's broken the state into regions, and several regions uh -huh. have moved to step one. New York City and the New York metro area is probably going to be one of the last areas to move. Uh, away from social distancing because of the density, the subways, uh, the fact that people work in office buildings and uh, and uh, use elevators. It's just necessarily, right. New York is built around uh, the exact opposite of social distancing. So it's, <laughs> it's going to take some time here uh, for, for this city. Uh, to, to move on the continuum. I think this city and this metropolitan area to move on a continuum. So we've got, we've got a patchwork. And, you know, a patchwork, theoretically, you leave it up to the governors and the mayors, but people can move around. I mean, people, a person in this who lives in Texas can move, go to Louisiana, get in the car, go across the border. Uh, people are not oh, fixed. Wow. So that's why uh, for different states, it may make some sense but it also defies some logic because of the ability of people to travel and move. 
Uh, talk about COVID and HIV AIDS. Is is there any, uh, I would assume if someone has HIV AIDS, they even may be even more vulnerable to COVID-19 yes. Yes. As, as a pre-existing condition. I mean, What's been the experience yes. uh, there? So typically, as you know, people that are infected with HIV AIDS have a, uh, a weakened immune system. Uh, majority of them have TB, which obviously affects the lungs, as well as pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, so it is imperative that people with HIV AIDS are taking the antiretroviral medicine. We have also mm -hmm. then said it is important that people know the HIV status because if you don't know your HIV status, you won't be taking the, the drugs, the antiretrovirals, right, to protect you. And so you're going to be at much higher risk of catching COVID and dying from COVID because you did not know your HIV status to begin with. Mm -hmm. So in order to empower yourself, know your HIV status and then take the necessary precautions and the medicine. Because, mm -hmm. my friend, we have seen here in South Africa, we know that, number one, South Africa is the highest country with HIV AIDS. 20% of the population is infected with HIV AIDS, and South Africa has 20% of the world's population living with HIV AIDS is in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so it has been um, a, a, a contentious, a, a conscious effort that we have made to communicate with people living with HIV AIDS, people with, uh, who live with people who live with HIV AIDS to make sure that they have enough medicine because they're not going to be able to obviously go out on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. So for us, you know, this has been uh, a very point of contention. But when we look at the number of deaths mm -hmm. in South Africa, majority of those deaths have been people over the age of 60 years old. Wow. And the ones that were younger than the age of 60 years old were people that had... Uh, conditions, pre-existing conditions, mm -hmm. like your TB, like your pneumonia, or some lung infection, or heart disease. Asthma, is asthma a challenge there? We have asthma here in the States. Asthma, Texas. asthma is a big one. Asthma Obesity. is a big one, especially amongst African, African people, as you know. Yes. So those people have really been at a higher risk. But luckily, you know, we haven't seen the number of deaths compared to, you know, African-Americans, for example. And that's one thing I wanted to, to ask you. You know, is it because of the lack of access to health services? Is it because of the so-called African-American lifestyle, right? Or, I mean, what... what so what it's, it, these, these things are practical? all related here in the United States. So the mm -hmm. starting point is lack of access to health care is much higher than it is uh, amongst the majority population here in the United States, uh, which is white. And that right. means that an African American is less likely to have health insurance or yeah. Medicaid and therefore mm -hmm. is not going to the doctor on a regular basis, getting checkups, doing preventive care. Mm -hmm. No question. Mm -hmm. There's a disproportionality. Right. Secondly, for us, uh, obesity, uh, hypertension, mm. and asthma are more prevalent among black Americans than under other uh, elements of the American population. Although those challenges, obesity, hypertension, uh, uh, cardiovascular, and asthma are still significant among the majority population. It's just mm. higher... So some of this is related to the fact uh, of, of, of the system in America uh, related to both health care, related to uh, the prevalence of processed food uh, in our diet, right. the fact that nowadays people may not get the same level of physical exertion and activity because of the types of jobs they do or the way in which they are transported. I always tell people my grandparents did not own a car, did not know how to drive. They walked everywhere or caught public transit. 
So my grandfather would walk five blocks, six blocks to get on the bus to go to his job. Mm. My grandmother would right. walk six, eight, ten blocks to go to church. They didn't have right. cars. So they had that activity was built into how they had to live. They did a lot of physical labor. Uh, and, 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 and for many people, uh, that may not be as much the same as it once was. But we also have this legacy of slavery, this legacy of segregation, which means that the healthcare system, fewer doctors serving the black community, uh, in particularly in a lot of areas, hospitals not being available and accessible. So it's a combination you know, of factors, no doubt, uh, here in the United States uh, uh, and in the black community, we have uh, issues related to uh, diet. We do have issues related to uh, inactivity in our lives, but we shouldn't turn it into, oh, all you have to do is turn around and correct that because in some instances, the availability of fresh food is more yes. limited in the African-American yep. community and African-American neighborhoods and urban communities are more proliferated by what we call fast food, quick eating establishments versus uh, right. healthy food eating establishments. Mm -hmm. So there's a range of issues. And, and so anyone, look, in China, in right. China, COVID affected those with pre-existing conditions far more greatly. And that's kind of yeah. a society that's of a single basic ethnicity. Uh, but right. pre-existing conditions meant that it was more severe. So it was foreseeable that here in the United States, that for people of color and African-Americans, uh, the uh, pre-existing conditions were greater. Therefore, the impact would indeed be we'll greater. greater. Now, my yeah. great concern now is that the testing is more available, I think testing should be available on demand. That anyone that wants 100%. to be tested should be able to be tested. We should provide it because in some cases, psychologically you're concerned about whether you have had it or whether yeah. you have gotten it or whether you're clear and free from the disease. Secondly, we, at some point, uh, the great researchers are going to find a vaccine. Uh, we've got to make sure 100%. that that vaccine is universally available to yes. everyone here in the States, but also across the globe and not a vaccine for those that have and a long <laughs> line for those that have not. Uh, and, and governments, including, uh, you know, wor the World Health Organization, uh, the United Nations and each government should be saying, let us plan for how we're going to vaccinate all of our people, those uh, that have access to a doctor or hospital, but also community-based vaccinations in right. community centers and schools and places that are close by in rural areas and urban areas. We've got to plan ahead for this. And we've got to realize that things like smoking, uh, lack of um, uh, physical exercise, we have to be much more focused on self-care. And I call yes. self-care self-love. You gotta love yes. yourself and therefore you have to care for yourself. And you gotta be you can't expect someone else to push on that. So we have to push in our community uh in a stronger yeah. way for self-care and more attention and more demand. I say the elected officials uh who control zoning and business locations, if you're concerned about too many fast food joints, zone them. Limit them through zoning. Limit them through the permits you give. You can do right. that. And if you look at higher income areas in the United States, they have fewer fast food establishments. They're there, but they're not a proliferation because they keep them out right. by limiting the number. Uh, and therefore, you still have family owned diners and small restaurants and places that uh, uh, you know provide a, a, a healthier array of food options. So. We've got a lot of issues, but you know, it's so fascinating to hear you. Mm. And I really appreciate your incredible insight, knowledge, and thought uh, about the Thank similarities, you. once again, between the experiences of the people 
uh, in South Africa and, and our experiences here in the United States. And, and that longstanding, I think, relationship can only grow closer, grow deeper. Uh, we can learn so much from each other. We can also be inspired and elevated by each other. Man, by, uh, by each other. And to me, that's, that's what's so powerful about this conversation you know, we've had today, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's remarkable. And I truly feel so honored and blessed, uh, to have oh, met you and to have connected with you. Thank you. And thank what you. I'm hopeful is, is that we can, you know, do these conversations from time to time, uh, that, uh, when things clear up and you get back to the United States, uh, yep. you can come and talk to a, a, a group of uh, urban leaguers, urban league leaders yes. from around the country and share your work and experiences. I know they would embrace that with great enthusiasm. And, you know, at some point in the future, we can come over and see you, uh, as we say, in the motherland, you know, on the continent. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, which, uh, which, you know, we love and, 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 and we embrace that, that, that connection and that relationship. And we got to make it stronger. we got to learn. Yes, we got to share culturally, politically, yeah, yeah. from the standpoint of social justice, from the standpoint of economic growth and economic development. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I'm just so excited about doing this. And in this pandemic, we wanted to have this conversation because here in the United States, we can be very inwardly focused and right. we hear about the global nature of this, mm. uh, but there's not been a lot of coverage about the impact uh, that it's having uh, on Africa, and, and yeah. this conversation is important so people understand why this is such an ex existential threat to who we yeah. are as a, as a global community, that uh, it goes beyond, you know, the borders of the United States. It's a global issue, and, and yeah. it, to the extent that it affects one, it affects all, and that's why we are in this together. 100%, my brother. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, you know, the only way we believe and we know that we will finally be able to reach and begin the long journey of emancipation and development yeah. is with the partnership and participation of our brothers across the water. Yes. We cannot do it without you, brother. This is an integral part of the journey that we must, we must walk hand in hand for we will never be able to achieve our dreams if we do not work hand in hand, brother. So I appreciate you giving Americans a glimpse of what is happening across the ocean. Yes. And to say there is a way if we decide, as long as we have the will, my brother, to make things different, to make things better, according to our interests and how we see the world developing, there is nothing that is stopping us. So I thank you for this opportunity, my brother. Hey, it's been a beautiful conversation today. Until we connect again, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, keep the faith. Thank you. And my best to your entire family and all of thank our you. brothers and sisters in South Africa. Stay safe, my brother. Thank you. Thank you.